this of former official of FIFA, Imo Sadamu, who said that the Nigerian police should not arrest him because the matters of FIFA and sport should not be dealt with in conventional courts, but only at the court of arbitration for sport. But now we find that FIFA is being, officials of FIFA were arrested by Swiss police and the US police and have been tried in court. Where does the power of the court of arbitration for sport and the powers of conventional law stand in, in the treatment of sporting matters? Okay, that's a good question, and it has an ethical dimension, but it's principally a legal question, and I'm not a lawyer. So I don't feel qualified to offer an authoritative answer. Uh, what I could say is that there is a thin line between the responsibilities of a sports organization and the responsibilities of criminal agencies. But it seems quite clear to me that if an, or, uh, if an organization exposes criminal activity, they should hand the case over to criminal authorities because they don't have the resources or legitimate powers to investigate, detect, and punish people. So, uh, my intuition, but I'd have to think about this carefully, and as I say, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, my intuition is that if someone is engaged in extortion or bribery or another form of corruption with a serious economic dimension, it seems to be almost certain that they will be breaking national and or international laws. So it seems perfectly proper then the sports organization hands those over. If I may digress just a little bit, I, I think the question you raise brings out a more general question for sports. When is it our responsibility as sports administrators, when is it a criminal uh, responsibility? So uh, in our lectures, if you recall, we took the issue of uh, uh, match fixing or event manipulation. <coughs> now this kind of match fixing or event manipulation takes many forms. Some of those forms are clearly instances of illegal activity, where for example, example a, a gambling syndicate has either bribed or extorted or threatened with violence or even death, an athlete or a team or a coach or a manager to make sure a certain uh, outcome happens. It's clearly criminal activity. Uh, what about where there is a tennis player, for example, who's tanking? Yeah. M maybe he's doing it because he's bribed or manipulated. Maybe, maybe that's a legal matter, but what about if he's just doing it so he or she can pick up the, uh, the, uh, the fee for being present at the tournament. But they're not trying to win, they're just turning up, playing one set, going off with an injury, they already had the injury, they were never intending to play the contest properly. <clears throat> that looks like it's a matter for sport, eh? I mean, did the player do anything wrong? What about if they don't put in their best efforts, like the, uh, the Asian badminton players at the London 2012 games? Did they break any laws? No, so why would it be a criminal matter? So it's, it's a sport matter. So in most cases, I think it, most cases, I think it will be reasonably straightforward to determine who is the authority here and who should be responsible for pursuing the matter. There could be, I have heard cases where you might blur the line. Let's take, uh, let's take uh, Lance Armstrong. And we must be careful about naming public figures, so we'll stick to the facts. Certainly, people did ask the question, was he doping? Yes, of course he was doping. We now all, all know this. But it seems that he signed contracts with sponsors. Who in the contract said, you must be riding clean? Now, um, this is both a sports matter and a legal matter, isn't it? Because it, it seems like, and I want to use the word seems, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems like he defrauded the sponsor. So. The question, is it a legal matter, is it a sports matter, kind of depends on, on the context. It may be one, it may be the other, it might be both. Uh, today we had a, a, a presentation about sexual, child sexual abuse in, in sport. And of recent there have been uh, reports in England about the cover-up of 
youth, young players over several years, the, the cover up sexual abuse of young male football players in Eng England. Where, where does a club draw the line between pushing, keeping quiet and pushing out the guilty when they were aware of the, the, the fact that this man, uh, the, this particular individual had reports that you know they, they were aware that he was doing some things illegally. Where does the, the where, where does the club draw the line between going out in the public and just pushing him out and letting him continue being a uh, predator on children across uh, sports across across several clubs in, in the country? Again, I probably want to make the same proviso here. Uh, I'm I'm not an expert in um, child sexual. Uh, exploitation, abuse, or in safeguarding. <clears throat> so there, there certainly are better people to talk about safeguarding in sport than, than me. Um, certainly I did work with Professor Celia Brackenridge who, who pioneered uh, this research globally and who did uh, fantastic work uh, to develop safer environments for sport. Uh, your question is, um, when does the responsibility lie with the sport or the club or the organization. And the way you ask the question is interesting because if you say they know that somebody has been abusing, then, then the responsibilities are really clear. They have an absolute duty then to report this to criminal authorities who will investigate it properly and who have the powers uh, and the force of the law. But I suspect a bigger part of the problem is ambiguity. When people in the organization think something's going on, but they don't know and they're not sure if they have sufficient evidence and so forth. And what we know, uh, certainly from the, uh, the 80s and 90s, is that coaches would be kind of warned. Uh, we think you're doing something, uh, we can't prove it, but frankly you don't have a, you don't have a future here. And um, I suppose this solved the problem for them, eh? But it just passed the problem on to somebody else because the club would just move around to another uh, region, uh, another uh, part of the country, maybe even a different country altogether. So this is a really serious issue. Um, and uh, it's made more serious because of the issue of vulnerability. Children and youths are, uh, we could say, intrinsically vulnerable. And uh, because of that vulnerability, coaches, managers, uh, organizers, administrators, they have a very, very serious responsibility to protect the welfare of children. So, one of the difficulties, again, there's a scaling problem. How big is the organization? If you look at the Football Association, they now have, thanks to Professor Brackenridge's research and responsible leadership by the Football Association, they've got very strong policies, very clear codes. So, so part of the response to this problem has to be a codification issue we need to develop and agree upon and get everybody committed to a series of rules, policies, and procedures as to how things will clearly happen. Part of the difficulties in the early days is nobody knew what to do with the problem. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why they just wanted to make sure the problem didn't happen in their club. That's no longer sufficient, absolutely. It, it's clear that we have stronger responsibilities to this. So um, part of it is gonna be uh, about uh, constructing structures codes, as I say, policies, practices. Part of it is about the culture. What kind of culture are we developing in this organization? Are people free to talk? You know, um, take a little example, uh, gymnastics. You know, in lots of gymnastics clubs, uh, coaches used to say, I don't want the parents here. They're, they're, they're gonna make things awkward, they're gonna ask questions, they're gonna get in the way, the kids are gonna be distracted. So they would say, just bring your kids, and, and, and leave them with us, with the experts, come and pick them up in two hours. And you could understand why a coach would say that, but really now you're creating a private space. You're creating a space which is uh, non-transparent by definition. Uh, and now we think that's just not good practice. So um, part of the response to this problem has to be a serious consideration by, by, by the, the senior athletes, by the parents, maybe by the junior athletes themselves having a contribution to the discussion, uh, by the leaders of, of the club or the organization itself. What kind, what kind of organization are we? What values are we? 
what behaviors to expect. So it has to be both a kind of structural response and a cultural response. Um, but, but again, we have the scaling issue. I mean, if you were a predator of this kind, my guess is you're going to stay away from a strong organization with good values, good policies, and good cultures. Because you're thinking, this is not the environment in which I'm going to be able to do what I want to do. So uh, uh, there is a scaling problem here. And it is the duty, I think, of international and national federations to lay out models of good practice. Don't leave it to the small clubs who have no money and no resources and maybe no time to do this. So here, I think national and international federations have to take a strong lead. Thank you.